I've spent a lot of time in the Heretic Kingdoms this year. I have travelled through Corwent, through Temuria, and through the Sura territories, trying to destroy the Godslayer Sword in the name of the Inquisition, and then trying to find a means to thwart the same Inquisition's schemes surrounding the Crucible of Souls. I've spoken to Games Farm's CEO, I tried to build a Wikipedia page for the developer, I even considered booking flights to Koshitze to see what kind of place would harbour the growth of a world like the Heretic Kingdoms. This world isn't like any other fantasy world, and Shadow's Awakening lets the player delve deeply into all of the nooks that hide so much character. The game might not be the most polished experience available, but just like the rest of the series, these small things work to the benefit of the product, especially now that the stability problems are totally resolved. This new adventure has the player travel through some new locations, as well as some that hadn't been explored since Cult, allowing the player to see how the passage of time has affected the world. Games Farm seemed to have considered everything when creating Shadow's Awakening, and far, far exceeded any expectations I had upon going into this game. If you're here because you're unsure about playing Awakening, please take this as a cue to go in blind and watch the world unravel before you. The Heretic Kingdom series is currently three games, although the second game, Shadows Heretic Kingdoms, is entirely included within Shadows Awakening, so perhaps there are only two games? The first entry, Cult Heretic Kingdoms, was released in 2004, and follows the journey of Alita, an apprentice mage who was whisked into the upper tiers of the Inquisition as she hunts the final relic of the Theocrat across the world. The Godslayer Sword is impossibly powerful, but Alita is able to destroy the relic in the end. However, along the way her Inquisition allies are tempted by the power of the artifact, and Alita is forced to kill them to prevent anyone's misuse of the sword. She then disappears into hiding, and is never heard from again. Shadow's Heretic Kingdoms is the first half of the follow-up to Cult, and was intended to be released episodically. The second half of the game wouldn't be released until 2018, four years later within the completed Shadow's Awakening. Events are slightly different between each game, but not drastically so. It would still be sufficient to play Awakening without knowledge of Shadow's Heretic Kingdoms or Cult Heretic Kingdoms. So while Alita is gone, the Inquisition certainly isn't, and some of their highest ranking members have returned from death. Because of this, Krenz, voiced by Tom Baker, has been forced to enlist the aid of a Devourer to help find a means to prevent the undead mages from their destructive wrath. The Devourer is no ordinary demon however, they are capable of having multiple souls within their form at one time granting the Devourer the ability to interact with the world of the living in the skin of any slain warrior it has captured. Krenz explains that the Pentanera's plans are to break the bounds of life and death, and have hell spill out into the world, so that all souls can be consumed by demons. The Devourer is a selfish creature, so this fate is unacceptable, and it agrees to assist Krenz. The Devourer is then offered one of three souls to use as a puppet within the world of the living. I chose Evia, the princess of the dead empire of Garulia for this playthrough. I believe Jasker is the canon selection, since his death was the latest of the three selectable characters, and there are still people living that knew Jasker, so there are interactions that he can have that the other two cannot. Still, I chose Jasker before so this time Evia takes the spotlight. With this, the duo travels to a blockaded Thol, where they must get their bearings for the modern world. Eventually, the player will find Krenz in hiding. While discussing their next destination, a member of the enraptured Pentanera, Carissa, appears and attacks. This is a cue for Krenz to leave Thol, and he suggests the player follow. Thol had been under siege throughout this adventure within the city, and the army surrounding the base of the mountain would not allow the Devourer to leave so readily. 
The army's captain, a Temurian called Tsar, is a narratively relevant soul the player must capture while they progress through this area. Having the ability to present as a Temurian is required shortly, but first the player must cross the Outlands. The Outlands are a vast desert that had once been a seabed and is filled with demonic magic as well as ancient tombs. While hiding at an oasis with Krenz, two more members of the Pentanera appear and attempt to kill the Devourer. The player is able to escape Valkyrin and Avenger this time, as the pair are not especially concerned about the demon at this stage. This forces the player toward the Temurian border, where they must gain access to a border camp. Fortunately, the weapon the Pentanera are using to gain incredible power was a Temurian artifact called the Crucible of Souls. So perhaps there is a means to destroy it hidden somewhere within the Wolf People's lands. The player makes their way to Duratia, the Temurian capital, where they enter the Ziggurat of the Sun and make their way down to the gate to the Tree of Worlds. At the center of the universe is an ageless dragon that can see all things, who should know of a means to destroy the Crucible. Upon humoring Grabak, it tells of a method that involves casting an especially potent magical item into the cauldron to destroy it. The beast then teleports the player to the outskirts of Kyalasar, the largest city within the Heretic Kingdoms, where Carissa awaits. That was the narrative of the entirety of Shadow's Heretic Kingdoms, and the rest is exclusively awakening content. Carissa immediately confronts the player as they exit Grabak's portal. She attacks, but since so much time has passed since the confrontation in Thol, defeating Carissa isn't especially challenging. Her soul is captured by the Devourer, and the group progresses to Kyalasar. While in the magnificent city, the Devourer can meddle in some politics, and gets the opportunity to collect another soul of a deceased legendary warrior. Then, they must infiltrate the Pentanera disguised as Carissa, and try to determine if they are aware of any magical artifacts capable of destroying the Crucible. The Devourer is found out and imprisoned, but not killed, as the Pentanera desperately want to kill Krenz, and won't discard their only potential source for his location. This provides time for the Devourer to escape into the sewers and flee to the sewer lands in the west, where the Pentanera had been stirring up a war to eliminate the Ishkai and prevent them from interfering in the Pentanera's plans. The player can use this distraction to steal Asura clan's Moon Chalice. The Sura use these chalices to empower their warriors, so clearly the chalices are exceptionally powerful. In order to get a hold of one, the player must invade a Sura tribe's supply store, while the player's Ishkai allies battle the Sura's main force for their chalice. With the task complete, the player has acquired a suitable magical artifact, but now must re-enter the city to put it into the cauldron. They must defeat the remaining members of the Pentanera along the way, while the Crucible of Souls tears through reality and begins unleashing demons into the world. After battling through to the top of Kyalasar and defeating the leader of the Pentanera, the Devourer places the Moon Chalice into the Crucible of Souls. It isn't powerful enough though, so the demon must cast itself into the cauldron to cause its destruction and save the world. But the price of avoiding it may be more than anyone is willing to pay. <laughs> With this new, grandiose narrative come some new gameplay mechanics too. As is clear by the UI changes, the game has scaled back the capability of each individual character during gameplay by only allowing them to have three active spells. Instead, each of the 15 characters has eight spells that the player can choose from, although they have to be leveled first. The soul bar has been replaced with a traditional mana bar and the craftable healing items have been entirely replaced with a rechargeable soul stone that can be used to heal or recover mana. This has allowed the spells to become more powerful overall, as they're now limited by more than their cooldown timers. 
It also means that a lot of the tedious node looting has been removed as Awakening totally lacks a crafting system, so there would be no need for the player to be constantly picking flowers. The Soulstone does slowly regain charges over time, so the downtime spent exploring still has gameplay benefits beyond the masses of loot hidden throughout the world. It is impossible to collect all of the puppets in a single playthrough, but because there are so many, the player must be sure to keep a decent range of equipment for the various members of the team. The amount of modeling work must have been ridiculous. Awakening's presentation is a noted improvement over the last game, but GamesFarm's decision to rebuild so much of the game is verging on madness. Almost every environment in the game has been remodeled and retextured twice. The Devourer occupies the Shadow Realm version of the same maps, so every alteration made to the Heretic Kingdoms must be reflected on the Shadow Map, and the visuals are fantastic. I couldn't find a weak or uninteresting object throughout the entire game. Even the Temurian models and animations have become something incredible. And Buddha is gone. The audio side is as excellent as ever, now with even more incredible music to accompany the new locations the player will visit. The voices, however, still have issues. Zar is now this massive, hulking beast, and yet his voice is still just some guy. You are guilty of murder. What say you? Accused, my lord, not guilty. She is accused of murder. I am law speaker here, Sage. Of course, my lord. You're accused of murder. What say you? The same guy, no less. And it still lacks any form of distortion effect or actual acting. Unleashed my true power, you would have been instantly destroyed. <sighs> but where's the fun in that? Hmm. And Grabak is no better. Such a strange choice to keep this in the game but change all of the visuals and fix the technical problems. That isn't to say Awakening isn't technically flawless. Some of the denser maps could have been better optimized, and the tall baskets aren't destroyed when you break them. But the game never crashed, which is a big improvement from the last game. And as minor as it might be, the change to the minimaps location is very welcome, because some of the maps are enormous. It was difficult to really comment on the world design of the last game because the player was shown so little. But now that there are so many different regions and environments to explore, I felt it was necessary to point it out. There's a vast desert in the northern areas, which is consistent between the mountain ranges. As the player ventures south, the environments transition to dense rainforest, and then a more temperate climate as the player goes further south toward Kyalasar. This is great geographic consistency, and it reflects how the climate would function on Earth if it were all squished together like the Heretic Kingdoms. I really enjoyed noticing this, but the glacial region in the west is actually further north than the Temurian rainforest, so it had better be extremely high up to accommodate the cold. The player accesses the Sura territory from a sewer network, and then doesn't ascend at all to reach the glacier. A nitpick I understand, but when the level design is this good, can I really expect less? There are so many paths to explore, all with something interesting to find along them, or some engaging puzzle. I'm not a huge fan of the ball rolling puzzles, it looks kind of crappy, but there are other puzzles that make excellent use of the game's unique mechanics. And changes have even been made to reduce the need to excessively kite enemies around pillars although I'm not overly happy about it. While the majority of this game is exceptional, there's something missing that I believed was integral to the Heretic Kingdom's experience. Sometimes, the game is supposed to overpopulate a room. That might seem really stupid, but it was a relatively frequent occurrence within Cult, and Games Farm even managed to top Cult's most populated rooms within Shadow's Heretic Kingdoms. The room I opened my video on SHK is still in Awakening, but now it looks like this.
I know that the crowds of enemies are close to objectively bad, but they're so memorable because of how ludicrous they are. In order to progress through this area, you have to deal with this tiny room with 20 enemies in it. The existence of these locations was enough to warrant multiple loading screen tips warning the player about them, but they're totally absent in Awakening. This doesn't mean the game is totally devoid of challenge, just that the most memorable locations are now narratively memorable, rather than mechanically significant. There are a much larger number of tougher enemies, and with the elemental matchups mattering a lot more than previously, those enemies can amount to some lengthy battles. I was given a lightning staff right before I entered the Sura Wastes, and got to struggle with the lightning resistant mud crabs and the lightning immune eels all over the place. I could have been less stubborn about my choice of weapon, but I wanted to play with my new toy. The demonic enemies resisting fire were also a letdown, since all of Evia's good spells are fire based, but it does thematically make sense. My personal aversion to melee characters within this gameplay style definitely haunted me throughout my playtime too, as most of the plot's significant characters are warrior characters. Getting close to the enemies isn't so bad on the game's default difficulty, but bumping it up to hard makes combat into a punishing grind that threatens to invalidate the melee characters. Just before my visit to Kyalasar, I was finding the combat a little too easy. The brigands were falling over around me, and the griffins couldn't handle more than a spell and some basic attacks. Changing the difficulty here was probably the worst place to do so in the entire game. Throughout this area, a rogue Tamurian shaman has been appearing to harass the player by summoning elementals before teleporting away. That shaman blocks entry to the city, and must be defeated to access the main gate. This boss splits into three illusions, and summons more powerful elementals during the battle, which must be destroyed before the boss can be damaged again. If this guy has increased health and resistances, which is what the difficulty selection changes, then the fight is unimaginably slow. Whenever there is a non-boss enemy within the arena, the boss is not present. And, as far as I can remember, the boss barely has any spells that don't just summon more adds. Perhaps if I had completed more of the side quests by this point, I would have had better gear and wouldn't have been so taken aback by this encounter. The side quests within Shadow's Awakening are implemented rather exceptionally, and can often be indistinguishable from the main quest. Upon meeting with Arashad in Thol, the player is sent to the city's burial grounds to complete a few basic tasks and get to grips with how the game will function. There are no tutorials, so while Arashad is guilty of asking the player to kill 10 spiders, the reason he does so is to the benefit of the player as well as the Guild of Silk. If the player continues completing tasks for Arashad, they will encounter the Spider Queen boss battle and then be asked to scout a path in order to evacuate the city when the army outside of it inevitably attacks. There is also a building on the main market square of Thol, in which the player can learn of a refugee Ishkai, and how they met their fate at the hands of a Sura assassin. This Ishkai is a soul that the Devourer can capture, allowing the player to play as an Ishkai archer if they wish. Thol also holds the first piece in a lengthy side story about plundering forgotten tombs, that is present throughout the majority of the game. There's the curse the Taimurian shamans employed out of desperation to protect their territory, which the player can lift if they choose. Kiri Malfagan had been captured by Sebek enslavers, and choosing to rescue her earns the player further political choices upon reaching Kyalasar. There are even branching paths within these side quests that lead to optional bosses or a different ending. I spent 17 hours with the game, mainly focused on the primary objective, but occasionally drifting off course to do some of the side content. Had I done all of it, I suspect that my playtime would stretch into the 24 to 27 hours range easily, but I didn't want to stray too far from the narrative for too long. I think the narrative basis of Shadow's Awakening is taking responsibility for one's past actions. For a large portion of the game, the threat of the Pentaneer's coming looms overhead, and there is nothing the player or Krenz can do about it. 
Krenz's plan had been to keep running away and hope that his pet devourer could accomplish something that would make the threat disappear. But whenever the darkness catches and corners them, the player has no idea how to tackle the problem that has appeared before them. So they mimic Krenz and run away. Throughout the game, the player must accommodate others during their travels. They build a team of capable people who rely on each other, but each member of the crew is still coping with the problems of their past. Because that's what the Pentanera is, the author's past. I'm sure it's a ubiquitous occurrence within many people's life experiences to rebel against their upbringing and try to prove that the things they had been taught were wrong, especially children of devoutly religious parents. When a thoughtful teen is welcomed into the wide world in which billions of people don't believe the earth was constructed in a week by an omnipotent being, there's a high likelihood that teen will become aggressively anti-religious. Talking snakes with legs? A pregnant virgin? Two of every animal? This book isn't the truth at all. Some people are consumed by this vengeance against organized religion. Valkyrin is that personified. His mission, even in death, is to stamp out all religious activity he can find. It doesn't matter if there are some benefits to be found within. If people are praying, they must be stopped. Evanger is the accompanying righteousness. He must win because he is correct. If Avenger ever loses, then he must have been wrong, and that is unacceptable. Krenz needs to overcome this. People change a lot as they grow, and it isn't uncommon to regret poorly considered actions they may have taken in the past. A teen might despise religion so much that they disown their religious family in retaliation. Perhaps they spend a few years away from home, angrily hiding from the people who raised them. But is it really that important? Would they regret the separation if their mother passed while they were gone? If their father developed dementia and started asking about them, would they not go to see him? Life is fleeting and your family won't be around forever. So take responsibility for your actions and go and be with them. Even if they look like monsters. It might be a rather introspective reading, I suppose. But recognizing the shades of grey around oneself and finding one's way to coexist with them is something everyone must do in order to accommodate everyone else. There really is so much love within Shadow's Awakening. I cannot comprehend how Games Farm was able to make something so utterly amazing. What had started as a charming little RPG has evolved into an epic, detailed, thoughtful series with so much to say if you're looking for it. Peter, Jan, Michal, Chris, thank you for this. I had decided on the video's title before I had finished really thinking about the game, and I truly believe that the answer to the question is Shadow's Awakening, Games Farm's magnum opus, is a resounding yes.